took on our frame Walked in our pain And now you're taking us higher You stepped into time You laid down your life to save us You took all our shame And on the cross it was laid And now you're taking us higher As we go from glory to glory to glory We'll never be the same We'll never be the same Yes, We go from glory to glory to glory we're forever changed we're forever changed you call you call me your friend brought into your endless kingdom by the blood i was made no longer a slave and now you're taking us from glory to glory to glory We'll never be the same We'll never be the same We go from glory to glory to glory We're forever changed We're forever changed And until we reach that day
shake us The victor has won And heaven has come The night has taken us high You took on the grave You took on the grave So not even death can shake us The victor has won in heaven to come The night taking us higher We go from glory to glory to glory We'll never be the same Take us time.
King God. You are a miracle working God. You are a miracle working God. You are a miracle working God.
never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go I never have I never will I'm never gonna let you go never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go I never have I say I don't I'm never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go I never have I never will I'm never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go I never have I never will yeah. Nothing can separate us 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 you and I in a way that we've never seen him before and we had no idea we missed it but also it comes in to show us where we have cracks and crevices and I thought the Lord told me this morning that if we would allow ourselves to be unveiled if we could pull the curtain back 
His presence will begin to show us the places that we are some practices that need to be healed. But it also can fill our heart up where we didn't even know we needed it. Because His faithfulness never ends. And that's what this song is about. So whether you're full of cracks and holes, or you're loving Him and you just need another touch, I want to encourage you to pull back the curtain. that we would have the grace, the strength, and the bravery to remove whatever veil may be in front of us so that we can see you face to face. And the water and the glory of your presence would begin to fill us in the areas. We need to be reminded where you are so faithful and you love us so much that we begin to walk in joy once again knowing that you are filling those cracks in our heart. That you've known about us from the very beginning and you know where we are right now. And most importantly, you know exactly where you're taking us. And we're going to look more like you as we journey with you. And Father, maybe there's some of us in here that have a thing in our life. We don't even know it's a crack. But would you just reveal in your truth and in your joy, because it's not condemnation. It's just a place for us to hold it up to you and say, Lord, will you heal this part too? Will you forgive this sin too? It is your joy and your pleasure to meet us face to face. To blow your breath inside of our spirit again and for us to be renewed and rejuvenated and revived once again. Even if we have a small ember burning in us, that you would breathe on it and we'd become blazing, fiery, passionate lovers. That where we feel weak and weary, that you would come in with your strong, mighty arm of salvation that is never shortened, and you can scoop us up and lift us up. Oh where our perspectives can change, where we can see things from your point of view. Father, I ask that this moment right here with you will be a marked moment where you raised up valleys, where you lowered mountains and where you've made crooked paths straight so that we can be before you in all of your glory, in all of your beauty, in all of us accepted and beloved by you your pleasure upon this house God rain your pleasure upon this people God tonight that we can be people who are so passionately in love with you because we know you love us and there's nothing that separated us from you that you're not mad at the cracks inside of our hearts that you're here to mend them so we can step back to that place where we go way, way back. We were with you in the beginning and you marked us for victory and you marked us for love. Yes. Let our identity shift. We know who we are in you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Let's just go back into this. Let's just lift our hands and worship and just think whatever needs to be removed out of my heart right now let it be removed whatever i need to see from your perspective jesus let me see it right now hallelujah bless your name jesus he's never gonna let you go he's never gonna let you go he's never gonna let you go I'm never gonna let you go. I'm never gonna let you go. I'm never gonna let you go. I never have, I never will. I'm never gonna let you go. I'm never gonna let you go. I'm never gonna let you go. I never have, I never will. I'm never gonna let you go. I'm never gonna let you go I never have, I never will 
on our favorite TV show is celebrating the, 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 the end of a long week. These guys are actually coming out there and starting their practice for today. So y'all give them a big hand because they sacrifice their Fridays and their Saturdays to feed us today. So, boy, the teenagers left and the room emptied out. It's awesome. Hang on one minute. I'm going to I bet y'all are wondering what's going on next, huh? Yeah, go ahead. I have to kind of give a little small intro. Um, I think uh, Pastor Rick, I know, struggles a lot of times trying to understand why he made us leave our comfortable place and come to Gatesville. And a lot of times we, as we search, we try to understand it and we don't figure it out and we don't know what he's doing and why he's called us out and, and uh, you know, he said, uh, there's a treasure, go buy the field. And, and I, I really believe that. And the amazing thing is that I found many treasures here, but I wanna give a special thank you to this, this treasure right here. Yeah. Yes, this is uh, an amazing man of God, kingdom minded like no other, and he is as talented as he is. I've seen him play keyboard. I've seen him play drums at the same time. I don't know how he does that. <laughs> yeah. 
And on top of that, he says, as much as I love worship and I love worshiping to God, he said, of all the things I would love to do the most is minister. I love to minister. So we're going to give him that opportunity. Y'all give him a hand. Thanks. You're building me up too much, man. Like, I'm not going to be able to live up to it. <laughs> First off, I wanted to, like, publicly say to both of y'all, uh, I, just, I really look forward to getting to know y'all. Like, I, I, like I, I haven't had really a lot of time to actually, like, actually sit down and get to know y'all. And I just was telling Tyler on the way here from Temple Service that I was like, I just wish I could sit down and actually get to know the real y'all. Definitely, definitely hang out and have dinner. And I loved the message this morning because he actually talked about, you know, like, uh, like why we do some of the things we, why we choose to um, indulge in stuff that, you know, the what we think is really ambition, kind of, what I was taking from it was, is actually the enemy, sort of, uh, sort of that, that, you know, that serpent, that snake, you know, that the enemy, um, which fiery passion is awesome. It's absolutely awesome. It's a good thing. It's an amazing thing, but we really have to make sure that we know where that fiery passion is coming from. Um, and I had this message planned like a, a long time ago, and then whenever you were talking about that, that whole uh, ambition and that drive, um, this, I really needed to preach this. It's about confidence, and it's about, like, uh, we do need to have confidence. And I believe, like, Christians should be the boldest people on the planet. We should be the most confident people there is. And when we walk into a room, the atmosphere should change a little. Like, I believe that. Hands down, and I believe God doesn't want to see shy, in a shell Christians. He wants to see people who are willing to almost embarrass themselves, almost, <laughs> almost get uh, a little crazy. And I actually recently found a, a, a scripture that I love in the Bible, and it says, if it, if it seems I'm crazy, it's to bring you glory. And uh, I absolutely love that because it sort of really defines my entire Christian walk because there are times I do things that people don't necessarily understand. Um, but uh, like, and there was a time this past week that I actually wanted to do something that people, I knew people around me wouldn't have understood. I was at work. And I was uh, listening to Air One or, or Spotify, something on my cell phone. It had the Christian music on, you know, so because like a lot of uh, radios playing random nonsense at work that I try to drown out. Um, but uh, How He Loves came on, How he, the, that song How He Loves. And I, when I listened to it, I uh, remembered back like just that past Sunday, we had worshipped to it so hard. We had worshipped to it. That song, we used that song to praise and, and love on Jesus and love on God at church. And whenever I was standing on my machine at work, I was just listening to the song. It wasn't, it didn't have the same effect. And I was like, I was like, why does this song not affecting me the same way? Why am I not on my face? Why am I not lifting my hands? Why am I not crying, crying? Why am I not closing my eyes? And it really got to me. And I started to say, well, it's just the environment. It's just the atmosphere. It's just the people around me. Those, there's, I'm outnumbered. There's too many non-believers around. And, uh, and I got to thinking, I was like, no, that's not true because God's the same there. He's the same here. Uh, so it's like, it's like, why are we so confident here in this building? Why do we have the confidence to do crazy things in this building, but we don't have the confidence to do it out there when we're worshiping the same God out that's in here, we're worshiping the same God out there. And when we listen to that music, and honestly, the music is played better than we play it. So like, it's, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking we should be able to worship to it better out there, right? I'm sorry, Tyler, but how he loves, like John Mark McMillan does it way better. Um, <laughs> anyways, it, it definitely comes down to our confidence. Uh, if we had more confidence, then it would, we would be able to do these things. We would be able to be those atmosphere changers, those environment changers. It wouldn't matter the environment. I think what has happened here, and I wrote this down, I think what has happened is our lack of confidence has convinced us that that's the enemy's territory. And that's not the enemy's territory. That's not. That is a lie. And our lack of confidence has made us believe that lie. And I do believe like every bit of this earth, everything, everything we walk on is, the, is God's, is God's territory. He has, he has asked us to share the gospel and proclaim his good news everywhere, no matter what the environment is, even though the environment sometimes would be scary. So I, I believe like with more confidence, we would be able to do that. And God, his word says that he is our confidence. God is our confidence. And I love it because God is also inside of us. Uh, his word says that his spirit is in us. So we have that. We have confidence inside of us. Everything we need is inside of us, but we tend to look towards other things. So I really want to hit on um, some of his assurances, like what, some of his, God's characteristics, because if we could really um, know them less and feel them more, uh, kind of, I guess, um, then we would, we would actually 
um, believes these things. You know, we would actually lean on God rather than leaning on. And I just realized I could not preach a message without a tablet. <laughs> without a tablet, I could not preach a message. Like I, I even God, no matter how much I admit that God is great and everything, like this is still kind of giving me more confidence right now. <laughs> like if if we're honest, if we're honest, I am more confident because I got this in my hand. It, let, let's be honest for a second, because of the fact that we do lean on other things. Though, though God is the best confidence there is, though Jesus Christ offers is the real true confidence, we do tend to lean on other things. So uh, before I dive in, I really want to make the, let us know the difference between uh, faith and confidence, because I don't necessarily want to talk about faith as much, but there is a difference between confidence and faith, because uh, if you think about it, faith is actually something like we produce. Um, faith, we don't, like, put it this way, we don't, have, we don't have faith that God is God. We have faith in God and what he can do. We have confidence that God is God. So confidence and faith are two totally different things. And uh, if we think about it, faith actually prompts God to do, and confidence actually prompts us to do. Like, we, we put out faith, and we move in faith to prompt God to do, and he gives us confidence to prompt us to do. So, uh, so the difference between those two is actually, actually, maybe, um, Annette actually read a scripture, I don't have the scripture up there, but um, Annette read the scripture about the lady who crawled through the crowd uh, to touch the, touch the robe of Jesus to be healed, when she was uh, sick, and I mean, she had no reason to be out, she was, uh, but she, she actually crawled through the crowd of people to uh, touch Jesus' robe to be healed, and I want to make it known that it had to start with confidence, it had to start with her being confident that Jesus Christ was, um, was the Son of God. It had to start with confidence. And then, then by the time she got through the crowd, then her reaching out and touching the robe, that was faith. That was, that was her moving on faith. So, so her being confident actually gave her more, actually put her in the position to use her faith. So it's, it's, like, it's like God wants us to do so much. God wants us to step outside of our comfort zone and do things so much. But it's like we, if all we have is faith, we're waiting for God to do it. <laughs> We're not, we're not doing it. And God's like, what are y'all waiting for? You know, so confidence starts, confidence is where, where it kind of starts. And I, a couple different ways where we can get more confidence, I think, and I'm going to say confidence like a million times, but the couple different ways we can say confident, that we can get more confidence is by really getting into his word. Um, I think we sort of, we like the fun part of Christianity. We really like to have fun and worship and stuff, but, but uh, on our daily basis and stuff, we don't realize that like his word has, his word is extremely fun. Um, we could totally get in, and, and we also get also a lot more confidence. In 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, two, verse 2, it says, Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. So this is tell telling me that regardless of if it's um, convenient for us, we need to study his word. And uh, I love it because sometimes even in the midst of the inconvenience, like he actually points out the best places for me to be working on. And uh, so even in the midst of our inconvenience, he can really work. And I, that's some of the best times where he works is whenever we, we don't necessarily want to. You know? um, but uh, it, it's so important that this book, and what, what Paul, I think, what Timothy, in Timothy is saying that we, it has to be more than a guideline. It can't just be something we do every now and then. The, the Bible has to be more than a guideline. And I sort of view it as uh, when Evan was two, when Evan was two, uh, his um, nanners got him a swing set. He got him a swing set, and I spent like three hours putting that swing set together because they don't come assembled. I don't know why the heck they don't come assembled. Um, but uh, they got uh, the swing set. I opened the box, and there's like a, a ton of parts in there. And I had a good idea how the swing set went together. Like in my head, I've seen enough of them. I've played on enough of them. But um, I, in that box, there was a ton of parts, and then there was some instructions. And you know, men, we don't pay attention. We don't pay attention to the instructions whatsoever. We don't. Uh, we just kind of have this idea, so we go ahead, we assemble the swing set, and I spent like two hours uh, putting it together. I put it together, and the swing set looked great. It looked, it looked awesome. It's still up today. It hasn't fallen apart. Um, but when I looked in the box, there was still a couple bolts in the box, a couple nuts in the box, and I was like, you know, we all use that excuse, like, those are just extras, but... <laughs> The company does not send extras. <laughs> they would be wasting money. That's a lie. Uh, we just use that excuse. Um, and I realized, like, if I looked at the instructions from point A to point B to point C, then those bolts would not be in that box. They would be on the swing set. And that's the way I looked at his word. Uh, that's what God gave me to actually compare to uh, reading his word 
because if you if you think about it it might all look good <laughs> it all might look good on the surface it all might look great but if we miss out if we miss out on if we don't if we just if we just glance at it there's going to be some a little pieces little bits of pieces of that God wants us to use in that plan to make an even prettier picture an even better picture uh, so to speak so his word can give us so much more confidence if we just choose to uh, truly dive in and and I'm I'm the worst right there like I, I try to dive in so much but it, we are we all we all lack if we're honest um, and as we go into this message I really want to ask this question where does your confidence truly come from what do you lean on so as we as we go through this message be thinking about that uh, question um, what is it that we're leaning on for confidence um, if you have to write it down and just like contemplate on it um, because we would all like to give the biblical answer, and that's Jesus Christ. He's my true confidence he gives. But if we're honest, there are other things that we tend to rely on on a daily basis. Um, we, all, we all love compliments. We all love to get compliments. Some of us love to really to give compliments. I have to point Josh Driver out back there, man. He has, he has a way about him that whenever I said atmosphere changer, I'm sorry. That man right there, I can walk into this room and I can get a compliment from that man any day of the week. That is so stinking awesome. Like that is, that's what I want to do. I want to be that confident where I'm okay with giving compliments. I don't need to keep receiving compliments. I don't need that. I, I, and I like to give compliments, but if we're honest, we all, I love it because we all have that in common. We all have the need, the want the, to be praised, to give a, get a little bit of edif edifying or self-esteem boost. We all have that. So that's something we share. We share the, the longing to, uh, and if, if, we're, if we say we never fished for a compliment, then we would be lying because we've all fished for a compliment at one point. I can remember my mom sitting back there, and she probably remembers. Uh, I, it, back in the day, my, my twin brother, Robert, he, uh, he like came out of the womb singing. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Like I could not ever compare to the singing that my brother does. He came out just perfect harmony, perfect pitches, and, and I, I'm not going to lie, I was a little jealous of him. So my mom would be playing the radio in the Suburban, and we'd be driving to the lake or road trip or something, and we should be playing like Billy Gilman or something, one of those old child stars. Uh, and Robert would be singing along, and uh, he would be singing so perfect. And I just, I wouldn't even care if I was singing good. I would try to sing louder. I would try to sing so much louder than Robert. And I don't know if she, my mom knows if I did this or not, but I was trying to sing so stinking loud just to drown Robert out, just to drown him out. Like, I don't care if it sounded good, uh, just to drown him out so I could get that compliment, so I could get that 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 praise that my brother was getting you know when I was better I was good at my own things like but I still wanted it so it, and we would all be lying if we never done something like that <laughs> if we never fished for a compliment um, but I love it because even though like we shouldn't be like relying on compliments and stuff that's something we all share in common um, so if we all have that common interest then confidence will help us true confidence will help us keep us from needing those compliments needing those accolades needing those relying on those things to continue um, turn with me to Philippians 3, chapter 3. We're going to start in 3, verse 3. Paul is going to tell us exactly where true confidence comes from. He says, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. Now, circumcised, circumcision was the Hebrews' form of confidence, pretty much. They, that was their form of acceptance, kind of. It was like a religious law that if, if, if you wanted to be confident and like assured of your faith, like you... You got circumcised. That was so. So circumcision was confidence to the Hebrews, um, and and Paul says true circumcision actually comes from the worshiping in the Spirit. Um, moving on, he says we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. So Paul's basically saying none of y'all. None of y'all even have the right to have confidence compared to the right I have to have confidence because he's going to tell us here in a, in a second of what all he went through, what all he did. Um, he said he's pretty much lived both sides of the story. And uh, he says, none of, he says, compared to the confidence, I should have confidence. If anyone can have confidence, I can have confidence. Uh, moving on, he says, uh, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience in the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. So he's saying, I obeyed the law without fault 
uh, so if y'all are claiming righteousness, I, I'm the most righteous. <laughs> he, say, so, uh, he says, and as for righteousness, I obey the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ for uh, God's way of making us righteous, right uh, with himself depends on faith. So what he's saying is like, I've, I've done absolutely everything. I've done, I've done the, I've followed the laws and actually held them of value. Uh, but as soon as Jesus Christ came along and Jesus Christ was like, did it for us. And Jesus Christ, what, after what Jesus Christ did, he said, none of that compares. None of that is, that is all garbage compared to what Jesus Christ did. So I love to compare the physical happenings that happened. Uh, you take the physical torture and the physical abuse that Jesus Christ went through, and then you take the physical act of circumcision, and you would think through circumcision uh, there would be some close comparison, but there's not. He says it's still garbage. I love it because the physical act has already been done. If you think, uh, uh, it, no matter what physical, they went as far as to, for mutilating, uh, to, to gain confidence when he's saying there's nothing compared to that. So he's saying basically our human efforts uh, have no value compared to what Jesus Christ has done. So if we think about it, we tend to every day uh, look towards things. Maybe, maybe it's uh, things like uh, working out. Maybe it's, it's all sorts of things. Look towards technology, look towards uh, compliments and stuff to give us that self-esteem boost to, to move along. And, and some of you might be thinking, well, that's, this is two, form, two different forms of confidence. But uh, if we think about it, more confidence in Christ it does make us more confident in life. So it, they're really not too, di too different. Um, self-esteem and confidence, the more confidence we have in Christ, technically the more self-esteem we should have. Um, because we are assured. This is not just assurance of our salvation. This is actual confidence. This is actual being bold, being brave. And I'm just thinking about all the old prophets when I was thinking about that word bold. I, was, I just prayed that prayer. I was like, God, please just make me more bold, make me more confident. And when I did that, I was thinking about all the old prophets. And I was like, and, and one, character, one thing stood out to me, what Jesus uh, wanted, did show me, God did show me as I was thinking about Elijah and, uh, and Moses even, and Noah, I was thinking about them. He said like, he, he, didn't, he didn't tell them to sit back. <laughs> he, said, he said, he didn't say, just, just, just be who you are, Elijah, and I'll do it. He didn't say that. He said, he said I want you to do it. He said, he said, he said I'm going to give you the confidence to do it. He said, I'm going to make you bold. <laughs> and he, he did it. He gave him the confidence to do it. God could have done every bit of it. So it's like thinking about it, thinking about it, I'm like, I want to do that. And I'm like, I, I feel like God, our, our father is a father who's like just so proud of us when we actually do, when we actually do things. And uh, if, we, if, we, if we have just faith, then we're kind of lacking. We have to also have confidence uh, to actually get up and crawl through that crowd and do what God wants us to do in order for faith to happen. Um, and uh, thinking about that circumcision, I, this isn't, actually isn't even... This just popped up. I think sometimes, like the way Hebrews were treating the circumcision, I feel like sometimes we do that with the church. <laughs> I feel like sometimes we, we are using the church as our own personal circumcision, to be honest. Uh, we're using the, the actions that we do in church. We're using the, uh, the traditions that we do in church. The, uh, sometimes, like, like, I think about it this way. Like, you walk into a, a brand new church, and, and uh, the first thing the pastor says is like, hey, how are you? How are you? When were you baptized? And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not baptized. And he's like, oh, we're going to get that done. We're going to get that changed. And, and I'm like, hang on a second. If the Spirit's not in it, if the Spirit is not in it, then it's just being dunked in water. It's just an act. It's just a circumcision. It's, it's, just, it's just a physical act of circumcision. It's not true circumcision. So it's like, it's like okay, why aren't you raising your hands during worship? I, he's like, well, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that. The Spirit's not in it right now. Like, wait, let the Spirit get in it. Like, it, you, you, I mean, so what I'm saying is, like, oh, these are all awesome things. Like, baptism is awesome things. Being a member is awesome things. Covenant is an awesome thing. But it's like, if the Spirit's not in it, then it's just an act. And that's, that's what Paul is saying here. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, he's saying nothing, nothing matters compared to the, uh, the true confidence comes from the Spirit. True circumcision comes from the Spirit. It can't be, we can't use churches. And I, that's not, I'm kind of moving away from my message, but... Um, moving on, we're going to move through four through nine. Uh, 
Paul continues on to talk about, well, actually, I want to get into some of the assurances, some of, some of God's assurances. I believe like if we can actually uh, feel these assurances, then uh, it would actually help us to have confidence on an everyday uh, life. And we all, a lot of us know these assurances. We've been in the, the church for a long time. We know the assurances. We've heard the assurances. But uh, how come it's not giving us that confidence we need? The, the boost we need. And I believe it's because we don't quite feel them. Uh, and maybe it's because other things are so physically present in our life. Maybe it's because other things offer a quick a fix, you know? So it's like, it's like maybe if we feel the assurances that, that God had, that his characteristics um, bring, then we'll quit relying on that sort of that quick, quick fix. Um, but I want to read Webster's definition of assurance. It says, the state of being sure or certain about something, a strong feeling of confidence about yourself, or, being, or about being right. A strong and definite statement that something will happen or that something is true. So that's an assurance. So we have that. We have that strong confidence. We should have this assurance that God is greater. That's, that's the first assurance I have. That, I, that really helps me. We should have this assurance that God is greater. We should know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is greater. That God is greater than what? He's greater than absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. He's happy. And I love it because uh, in John, 1 John 3, uh, we're going to start in 19. Uh, he starts off by saying, Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God. So he's basically saying, like, our credibility comes from what we do, not what we say. Like, n we have no credibility to non believers if all we do is talk. Uh, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. I love this because feelings in there is plural, like, that's every feeling. That's not, just, that's not just on my days I'm happy God is greater. <laughs> that's not just on my days where I need him God is greater. That's, that's not just, just in my sadness, just in my sorrow. That's in my happy. That's in my love. That's in my hate. That's, in my, that's everything. All the feelings. He says God is greater than those feelings. And sometimes I find that hard to believe. To be honest, I get angry. I used to be an angry little teenager, and my mom knows, and I love it. I, actually, I, this did not help me whatsoever. Anger did not help me whatsoever growing up. Uh, I was, in high school, I was the smallest high school kid ever. I was like so tiny. I'm still pretty tiny, but if you can imagine a tinier version of me, uh, I, I was, and I was so full of anger, and so it didn't help me, because like being angry, I picked fights, and I was picking fights every, no matter who I picked to fight with, they were bigger than me. So it's like, it's, it, it did not help me growing up, but I didn't really understand it then. I do understand it now that sometimes feelings are so stinking powerful that we don't even think. We don't even think before we respond. Like the feeling actually causes us to respond. And I, Annette actually said something like that in one of her words. I think you said like your daughter-in-law would like hold her breath when passing roadkill or something. Just the feeling that she was going to breathe in. Um, but it, it, the thing is, is, like, feelings are so powerful. So I'm thinking, if feelings are so stinking powerful, then why don't we start to feel that God is greater? Why don't we start to feel that God is greater? Because if we start to feel like God is greater, it's gonna, that's going to overpower any anger. It's going to overpower any sort of uh, response out of these feelings. And as I started thinking about anger, sadness, fear, jealousy, um, stuff like that, all the negative feelings that we should never respond out of those feelings, to be honest, um, Unless, well, be without thinking about it, we should never respond out of those feelings. <clears throat> but I started to think about like love and peace and joy, um, the good feelings. And I'm like, there's got to be a time where we can respond without thinking. And I'm thinking, if you love someone, if you love someone, you should be able to respond without thinking. And I love God. And we love God. We should be able to respond to him without thinking. We should totally be able, we should be that confident in what he can do. We should be that, have that much faith that we should be able to respond to him without thinking. Um, and and that's, this is love. And so it's like, I, I, and I think like if you love another human being, you should be able to do the same thing. If it's true love for another human being, you should be able to respond without thinking. If my wife was uh, um, being aimed at with, a, I don't know, a bow and arrow. I would jump in front of that arrow without thinking. Um, now, if a stranger is being aimed at with a bow and arrow, uh, could we say the same thing? <laughs> I don't know if I would jump in front of that. See, I would like to say I would, but what I'm saying is that's a response without thinking. That's a response because I love my wife, with, so it's a response without thinking. Um, and I think that's how we should, we should treat uh, God, respond without thinking. As far as anger, sadness, and fear, we should always think before we um, respond out of the, in those feelings. <clears throat> Someone have a water up here? Thanks. 
I never, never mind. Oh, Tyler, you're right. Thanks. Um. <laughs> My confidence. One handed. <laughs> Did I already read this? Uh, so we will be confident when we stand before God, even if we feel guilty. God is greater than, yeah, I already read that. God is greater than our feelings. Keywords plural, I'm moving on. The second assurance that I have here is uh, God is a good listener. He's always listening. Um, again, we know this, but if we're all honest, we don't feel it sometimes. We don't. Uh, I, and I was just talking about this to Tyler in the car. Sometimes I feel like God's not listening. Uh, but to be all, truthfully honest, according to what his word says and according to what I believe and I know, God is always listening. And I believe, truthfully, I believe that he always answers. Always. There's not one time where God hasn't answered me, regardless of if I hear it or not. Uh, he is answering. I still feel like God is answering. I still feel the atmosphere of a father answering a child. And uh, that's the way I look at it. Like, I still feel like there's an answer there, whether I heard it or not. And that tells me that he's a good listener because he does. I believe if he was, I, I'm thinking like as a, as a parent now, I'm, I've been a parent for six years, six years. And uh, I've developed this extremely awesome ability to just completely tune my kids out completely just like my wife pointed it out to me uh i was sitting in the passenger seat and my kid was in the back he was saying dad 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 i didn't hear it dad 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 and uh, she said are you gonna answer him and i was like i was like i didn't hear him and i i'm, th I'm thinking i got just got I got a superpower or something i i got something but i think all of us fathers have a little bit of that where we can tune our kids out i'm i'm so thankful my father in heaven doesn't have that power. I'm so thankful that my father does not have that ability to tune me out. He doesn't, he doesn't even want that ability. He doesn't want to tune me out. My, there's never enough nagging from me uh, that he's going to say, I'm just not going to listen to you today. And I, I, I love the fact that he doesn't have that. Um, mo moving on in John, he says, uh, and he knows everything, dear friends. If we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. So this tells me that God is always listening. The, the thing is, is are we remaining in obedience? Are we remaining in that obedience? The importance of remaining, the importance of actually staying in touch with him and listening to him and being obedient to him, that, that is so important on whether or not we're ever going to be sure or confident that God is listening. Um, we need to be confident that God is a good listener and that he's always listening. Um, but if we don't remain in obedience with him, then we're always going to question because we're never going to get what we want. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like a, if we're miss, my kid's misbehaving in Walmart, he's not going to get the toy when we get up to the checkout. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. If we, if we remain in obedience with him, then we, we have a, so much potential to actually gain what we want. Um, and I, I love it because like the more you remain in him, I actually found that I, the more satisfied I am with things on earth, like the things, like I'm more satisfied with the, no money in the bank, you know, I'm more satisfied with the, all these things because I, because he actually gives me like so much more confidence in that area, you know, it's, it's like, who cares? He starts to, starts to really make, satisfy me in all my weak areas, uh, th things that I, you know, I long for more finances. Well, he's like, you'll just be happy with what you have. And that sounds like something a dad would tell a son. Well, just be happy with what you have right now. It'll come. Um, I want to read uh, John 15, and I don't want to really read all of 1 through 17, because we've all read this. We all know this. Um, it's the grapevine, and, you know, I am the true grapevine. We'll start and skip around. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He's the what? He's the gardener. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so thankful he's the gardener, because uh, I am not a good gardener. <laughs> uh, my, my plants will die. We actually just got, we got, we went to HEB, and they had, um, they had those Venus flytrap things, uh, and we bought one. And I'm like, this thing's got to live. It's a Venus flytrap. It's got to live on its own. We shouldn't even have to. We should only have to water this once a year. Uh, and so we got one of those. So hopefully, hopefully my gardening skills will uh, increase. But anyways, I'm so glad our father is the gardener. Um, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more fruit. 
you have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. So this is how important it is, because he's saying, I rem if, I remain, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. If you don't remain in me, I won't re remain in you. You're going to get that the prune chopped from the... Yeah, you know, that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, that's the importance. It's not just important to get what we want. It's important because we want him to remain in us. Uh, Amen. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. <clears throat> yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. We're going to move forward a little bit. I don't know what verse this is, but you can catch up. Uh, Commandments, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. This is actually, he's saying, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. I think a lot of us are expecting God to produce that fruit. <laughs> I think a lot of us, so he's saying, he's saying, you do it. You go produce that lasting fruit uh, so, that, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. So we are to actually do and produce lasting fruit, produce lasting love, and you know all sorts of different good fruit, uh, long-lasting fruit. But if we, if if we're going to do that, we are going to need to be confident Christians. We we have to be. We can't do it and be weak Christians because if we're only producing fruit in here where we're the most confident, kind of we're not producing lasting fruit. You know what we're producing? We're producing here and there fruit, <laughs> fruit that's just. Only at church, uh, you know. You know what I'm saying? So, so let's let's uh, get more confidence, so we can produce that fruit. And what he's saying is, like, actually, the fruit producing is what enables us to get what we want. He says, he says, uh, if he says, we'll give you whatever you want. He says, produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you want. So I love it because um, I'm kind of one of those people that's like, I want to figure it out before it happens. A type of person. I want to I want to figure out what I'm doing before I even get there. You know, I want to figure out the plan. Um, and, and normally I'm kind of, actually as I get older, I'm getting more like that. Because I remember like back in the day, I was just like, go, go just go. But now it's like, we got to plan this out. <laughs> we got to have the diaper bag ready. We got to have all sorts of things. Um, uh, we got to have money. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I started to think about this scripture, like how, how, how God answers our prayers. And if we compare uh, our fruit bearing, our fruit producing, um, to prayers being answered, and this might be a weird way of looking at this, um, this story, but I, this is how God talked to me. He's like, well, if you produce no fruit, this is where I feel like God really, say, most of the time he answers, it's like yes, no, or later, not right now. Um, and that's where I kind of stay a lot of times is in the not right now um, category. But he says, if you produce absolutely no fruit, then your answer is a no. <laughs> Your answer is pretty much a no. If you're not producing fruit, you can probably be sure not to even go to God and ask for what you want. If I'm, be, if I'm being honest, pray for someone else. Don't pray for yourself because you're not producing fruit. Uh, and if I'm thinking about it, if I'm thinking about it, if my fruit's not lasting, if my fruit's just here and there fruit, a fruit that happens randomly or when, it, when it's convenient to me, uh, then it's probably going to be a not right now because I'm not ready because you're not ready. You're not producing long enough fruit. You're not ready for what you're asking for. Um, and then if it's, you're producing lasting fruit, you're remaining in me, you're being obedient to me, you're staying attached to the grapevine, then it's a yes. Then it's a yes. And, and, and maybe it's not always a yes. I don't, I don't fully understand God's will, but what I am saying, we can get a pretty good idea of what our answer is going to be by if we actually go back and we look at the fruit that we're producing. It would, to me, I'm like, it would save me a lot of trouble because I'm sitting here waiting on an answer. And, and I love it because I don't think God wants us to not ask. You know, I don't think God wants us, because I found recently that like asking for things, even if I'm not ready for those things, um, he shows me the areas that I'm weak in to fix in order to, get those things. So we should still ask, um, but we could actually, we can almost actually see, envision our answer if we look at the fruit that we're producing. And I really wanted to read all of this just to mainly point out the fact that we have a, a gardener that if we, if we rest on his assurances um, that he is greater, 
that he is a good listener, that he will never leave us, then we have a gardener, someone to take care of us that is greater than everything, that is a great listener and that will never leave us. We have someone who actually, and I've literally started thinking about everything a gardener does. And I started thinking about all of his, all of, all of a gardener's characteristics, you know. And my wife, like she's way better at it than I am. And she has, we have a rose bush now in our backyard that actually blooms, you know. When we, when we moved in, when we bought the house, this thing was like just dead and rotted. And she cut it all the way down to the ground. And uh, then it like came and it's got like nice big purple roses on it. And I'm, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, man, that's, that's because Ashley cut it down. <laughs> like that's, that's awesome. Like it, it grew back even better once it was cut down, once all the dead stuff was cut off. Uh, I'm getting kind of sidetracked from confidence and assurance. But uh, that last assurance there, I just said it. I said, God will never leave us. Um, do, we, do we feel that? Do we feel like God will never leave us? Because uh, there are definitely sad times and, and sorrow times where it does feel like um, God is absent, you know? And, it, and it's just a feeling. We know for sure. We know that he's not. So don't, you know, crucify me. Um, God will never leave us. But sometimes there are situations where it feels like he's absent. He is totally not absent. He's completely not absent. Actually, he is working. But I think what the problem is, is during those sad times, during those hard troubles, a lot of times our first prayer is take this trouble away, is take this away, is take this away from me, which what we should be praying is, God, come in to my situation. God, come into my situation. God, just be present with me in this situation because truthfully, those problems, what is it? Resistance makes us stronger. And I feel like, I feel like that's what happens is God's like, okay, you're at a point where you're going to, you're going to have resistance and it's going to make you stronger. Don't ask for it to be gone. Don't ask for it to be gone. Instead, just ask for God to be next to us. Ask for God to be present. And he is always present. He is always present. He will never leave us. And if we can feel that he will never leave us, it will make us so much more confident, so much more bold. Uh, so it'll make us those atmosphere changers that, that we need to be. Um, so let's kind of break that habit of just constantly praying for the the sadness and the stuff to go away, the, the trouble to go away. Instead, let's, let's make it more of a habit to say, God, I, I'm sad. Can just be with me, you know? Um, I love that there's an order. Rick Warren, actually, I was listening to Rick Warren, um, and he was actually talking about finances, but he said something that I've, like, added to my prayer life. Like, I've added this phrase, and it's like, I love your order, God. I just love your order. And Rick Warren said this. He said, I love the fact that there's an order. And finances, he said, like, if you want more finances, then it's pretty simple. Put God first in your finances. That's where you start. And then it's like, and then you have tons of, did you know there's more parables about, like, money in the Bible than there is about, like, heaven and hell? That's, I just found that out. Rick Warren told me that. He's, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm like, it's amazing what you can watch on YouTube, you know? Uh, uh, there's more parables about, <laughs> there's more, I know. And that's technology. That's me leaning on technology again, too, because I found out that I can't even write a sermon without going to Google every now and then. Like, I'm like, I'm like it's all in the Bible, but I still go, like, to Google, and I'm like, what does this mean, you know? Uh, uh, but anyways, uh, he said, I love that there's an order. And I started adding to the map, that to my prayer life, and I started adding that to every aspect of my life. Like, I love that there's an order. God, I love your order. Because the order is so crucial. It's like, it's like no matter what you need, putting God first fixes like it, it it that's your first step to getting it done and getting over with putting god first fixes it not just in your finances but in in everything so if we can put what's awesome is like we tend to not put him first when but we know that he is greater we know that he is a good listener we know that he has the ability but we tend to i put it like this i told my wife this earlier I put it like this i'm about to sit down and eat breakfast at my breakfast table and I got a big bowl, and I got milk, and I got a spoon, and I've got two boxes of cereal. I've, well, I've got the, I've got the first, I've got the giant bag of Tutti Fruities, the generic brand that I usually buy because it's like better for your budget, you know? Um, but then you have the Fruit Loops with the toucan and the, the real sugar, you know, and, and the, the best, the better tasting kind, the original. But uh, if any sane person, I think, is always going to, if they don't have to pay for it, if they don't have to break into their bank, they're going to go for the, they're going to go for the Fruit Loops, right? The Toucan, the, the original brand. And I would, I would go for the, the original brand, the best kind of cereal if I didn't have to pay for it. Guess what? We didn't have to pay for it. We don't have, the physical has already been done. The physical, in order for us to get that confidence, it says that God is our confidence. And guess what? That physical part, Jesus Christ, you know, on the cross, that torture, that pain, it's already been done. 
and I don't have to do it. Like, like that's like I, well, that's the way I'm looking at it. I'm like I, I don't have to I don't have to pay for it. It's it's already and yet we still turn to technology or addictions, uh, things that make us feel temporarily confident. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? And my wife said it's 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 maybe it's because it's like a quick physical thing right in front of us. It's so it's so present that it's easier. And I think that's wrong. I think the more we can realize that, I, I, she's onto something there, but I think the more we can realize that God is more present, that God is, God is present beyond that. And God is so much better than that. Once we can get that assurance, the assurance, so once we can feel the assurance, because we all know it, we all know those things, but once we can feel it, then the confidence will truly come. In Deuteronomy 9, 3, this is kind of another assurance that I didn't really write down, but um, it's the assurance that God is always fighting for us. He's always, yeah, he's always fighting for us. He's always helping us out. Um, know, therefore, today that it is the Lord your God who is crossing over before you. As a consuming fire, he will destroy them, and he will subdue them before you so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly, just as the Lord has spoken to you. I love it because he says, uh, he, he goes before us, he destroys them, he subdues them, but he doesn't get rid of them. He says, you can go. He says, he, he says, I will do this. I will weaken the enemy so that you can go and drive them out. So I love it that he's not, he's not uh, a go-to to fix all. He's almost like a go-to to, to make you better, to make you get able to fix it all. Make you able to fix it all. And, uh, and that's kind of the last assurance that I've got. And I just want to pray. And I would love for y'all to pray with me. Like, uh, um, really pray with me. Because like, I think we could all use some more boldness. And we could all use some more confidence. Um, so whether you want to say it out loud or not, or just close your eyes and say it in your head, just, just sort of repeat after me or, or pray for more boldness uh, in your own way. But I want, I want to pray. Uh, Father God, make me more bold. Make me more confident. Make me more willing and able to do everything you want me to do. Make me more willing and able to proclaim who you are, no matter my environment, no matter the atmosphere, no matter who is against me. Let me rest on your assurances. Let me rest on who you are and your characteristics. Let me always look towards you and lean on you for my true confidence. Let me never go or let me never lean or rely on anything else, Father. Make me more and more dependent on you, Father. Show me areas where I am starting to become, develop a dependency, Father. Develop something I'm relying on, Father. And take that and show me what you have to offer, Father. Make me more bold. Make me more bold, Father. We love you so much, Father. It's in your name. It's in your name. Amen. amen. I know. Mikey. Amen. Sonny did good. Amen. Pastor Annette and I were over there exchanging our hits. They were subliminal, but definitely needed. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you for listening. And uh, thank you for answering. You were asked to preach today, and you said yes. You know, you know as, as uh, sometimes we want to back away, or I do, um, because of not feeling confident, he's the only reason why we do it. Amen. Such a good word. Amen. Amen. I am so thankful for tonight. Today was such an amazing day. Um, Pastor Ricky absolutely floored me with, uh, first off, I love your tenderness. I don't care. I, I've watched this, this man for years, and um, the one thing that has always made me cringe is, for one, in the beginning, it helped me become who I am because of his sincerity and pa him and Pastor Annette, they don't, they definitely have removed the veil. Um, 
in their lives to help people like me, help people like my husband come to the place that we are. And then, uh, but once I really got to know him and I started loving him, I became more protective of him. So in that, I get very nervous when he starts revealing his heart to people because, um, you know, I'm always afraid someone's going to, you know, use it against him. But today was different. And uh, it reminded me that the Lord definitely has placed a huge calling on him. And I love his vulnerability to Jesus in spite of, and like Mike, Mikey said today, um, to know that our confidence is in him. Our confidence is in Jesus. And even in bearing yourself and making yourself naked like that in front of people, um, you know, you always walk away and wonder, you know, is, is someone going to say something about it? But today I was reminded that they don't have anything to say, but I love you. And you screwed me up today. <laughs> in a very big way, but in a good way. And especially with John 3.19, I don't think I'll ever be able to look at the scripture again ever the same because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and when he said that that love was agape love it disgusted me on so many levels because when you agape because i always look at the agape love of jesus that i don't have to do anything for it but I have agape the darkness in my life, and it has nothing to return to me. And uh, so Jesus is like, okay, let's stir this stuff up. But he's doing it in a good way. So I'm very thankful for today. I thank you for Pastor Rick's word, Pastor Mikey's work, word, and worship. Guys, y'all nailed it. You killed it today. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good week. And be blessed, be safe, and I love you. Y'all have a good night. The house is so simple, faith like a child. I give you an answer, you take me a mile. I feel the wind.